I meant on the um, day you on the days you fished. Yeah. What time did you hit it? You know, we found it early. Fishing wasn't that good. Yep. Around noon, one o'clock. How long did you stay out? Uh, they shut off around like three. Serious? Yeah. And then it was a early evening. Wow. Hey guys, uh, so uh, broadcast is live. Uh, we will get started here in about five minutes, um, but wanted to uh, start letting everybody hop on here. Uh, when you hop on, uh, feel free to, in the question section, to uh, drop you know where, where you're currently located. What city, city are you dialing in from? It was nice to get a heck of weather. Oh, perfect. I'll sit back. Yeah. Jim, I think you brought it back with you. Well, hey, you know what? When I was coming back and I heard that the weather was kind of comparable to where we were at, it was awesome. It's kind of made my day. So we don't want to fish fry or what? Yeah, we need to. How big are these flays? You know, them things are probably a pound. Really? A pound. Yeah. Wow. We got yeah. uh we got Mark on the line from Fort Worth, Texas. Welcome, uh, Mark. <laughs> Mark, I just come from uh, Colleen. We got uh, John uh, from East or sorry Elk Grove Village, Illinois. Uh, we have Michael from uh, Lakewood, Ohio. He said it's sunny and almost getting warm. We have Muhammad from Dallas, Texas. Hey. hey. You know, I look at the weather and I feel sorry for like Arkansas and through there. They're always, always got weather. We missed it for that next day. It looks like a tornado. There's touchdown. The long drive across Texarkana. They, they used to that stuff though. Uh, you have that and you have the opposite. We got uh, some of the clients up north in Michigan still are getting... You know, they're just thawing out. <laughs> <laughs> we got uh, John. I'm here from Odessa, Florida. Uh, Nick in Johnson City. It's said Ten. sunny and 60. <laughs> got Mark from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Couple more minutes here. Uh, let some people hop on, and uh, and we'll get this kicked off. If you, if you just did just hop on, um, you know, feel free to in the the question section there drop uh, what city and state you're dialing in from, and uh, welcome. I think Dallas, Texas, is a king of bridges. <laughs> they got some oh, dandies. Oh man, they got some dandies too. Oh. All right, we got Sar Simon from Victoria up in Canada. Uh, we got Eric from Rochester, Michigan. Uh, Jason from Canyon Lake, Texas. A lot of Texas people today. Texas folks. Yeah. Um, we got uh, Domingo from uh, South Elgin, Chicago, Illinois. We got Christina. Uh, we have Jose working out of Cincinnati, Ohio, so just up the street from us here. Also have Rachel from Cincinnati. Welcome, Rachel. You guys won't hold, hold this up too much longer. Um, we'll go ahead and get things kicked off here. Um, first and foremost, wanna uh, welcome everybody and our guests uh, here today. Excited to announce our, our two guests for our webinar today on the five critical elements to consider when machining aluminum castings. Uh, so two, two guests you have here today, um, I'll get to here in a second. Uh, what I wanna do is if you do have any questions uh, throughout the webinar today, make sure you are dropping those in the question section. We'll do our best to, to answer those questions throughout the broadcast today. Um, if any questions do go unanswered, uh, don't, don't 
worry. Uh, we'll get to you after uh, the webinar if we can't get to it in the time that we've allotted for the webinar today. Um, the webinar and presentation slides will be available to attendees and we'll send those out uh, following the webinar um, as soon as the, the buffering goes through. So with that, let's go ahead and introduce our two guests today. So all of you uh, probably, if you've hopped on these webinars before, recognize Tim Weber. Uh, he's the bicycle enthusiast and uh, he's, he's back for a fifth time here. Hmm. Uh, and then we have Jim Whitaker. Um, so a lot of you hopping on from Texas. Jim actually just got back from a a fishing trip down there where they caught over a thousand fish, right, Jim? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Brought them back to Indiana. Yep. So a lot of experience from from both these guys here uh, in the the machining and the, the casting industry. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you guys. So how you've been machining a long time? How many years have you been machining casting? Uh, thirty years. Is that right? Yep. Wow. Yep. How'd that happen? <laughs> Well, actually, I, I went to a program through uh, high school, and um, when your dad was still alive, he was called over to the school and said, "If you got anybody graduating, um, we're looking for a, a guy." Mm -hmm. um, which they nominated me, and I signed up. And when I graduated, I started. And actually, the next day. Is that right? Yeah. Jeez, Pete. That's wild. Yep. Yeah. All right, so we're talking about, we get a casting. Casting comes from the foundry, mm. okay? How critical is the material? The material condition, the, the, the heat treat part of it, you know, walk through that a little bit. Yeah, for us, when we get the casting down, uh, there's a lot that goes in just to casting it. Um, we put, we, we need the casting to be straight, you know, check for flatness and, uh, you know, certain flashes. Uh, during window areas or whatnot, where we might be clamping, uh, we like for those to be, you know, cleaned out. You know, if not, we put a little secondary operation in the machine before it goes on to, yeah, sure it's right mm -hmm. before you mount it. How does uh, so? Some parts run through here, unheat treated. Some run through T6. Some through mm -hmm. T5. What's the difference? Yeah, the difference is uh, 356 cast aluminum on heat treated. Um, guys say, well, this thing kind of machines gummy, mm -hmm. um, which it kind of does. And it might change a little bit of your choices of tooling um, because when you cut it, you might not see that shiny look like you would machining a piece of billet, okay. 6061. Um, now, there's a cost associated going to T6. It's kind of my favorite. All right. Um, because why? What happens with T6? What's it look like? It's it's a darker color. It's uh, it's actually a lot stronger. Right, right. Um, but the machining, of, you know, the thread quality, the finish, surface finishes, they're just easier to achieve. So you've in, in a talk in the past have talked about chips. So the, the, I'm assuming if it's gummy, it's not chips. What? What? Tell me about that. Well, it is, it is chips, and it kind of comes off more like, you know, you would think is like a, a tearing effect. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of good tooling out there that when we've got to do something that isn't heat treated, uh, PCD diamond, uh, maybe roll form threading right. instead of uh, cut tap threading. Uh, there's methods for cutting it, uh, no doubt, you know, because the customer might not want to, you know, there's some parts that can't price. be heat treated because they just turn into a pretzel. You know, I mean, yep. there's no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the physical physical strength or the structure of the part definitely becomes a trick for heat treat. Um, how about speeds and feet on raw T5 and T6? Are they all similar? I mean, does, if I you write a program, one of you guys writes a program. And you run it. Is it faster with the T6 or is it? They're they're pretty similar. Uh, the difference being, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that do a lot of high speed machining, mm -hmm. um, which we do too, up to a certain limit. You know, when you're talking about a casting that's a near net shape part, and you're holding it, and you got the best work supports and stuff like that you can do to maintain the integrity of the part. You can only get after it, you know, so fast. But um, so when you say high-speed machining compared to machine and casting, this is probably, you know, you get about halfway there. Okay, interesting. Um, 
Let's see. Let's go on to the coolant and cutters because that seems like a natural moving forward. Yeah. Tim, actually, before before you go forward there, so I had a really good question come in from Rachel. Um, so if a part's slightly warped uh, before T6 heat treat, is it still machinable? Um, and if so, you know, what are what are some options or routes that you go through? Sorry, I said Tim, uh, like actually like Jim to answer this. Uh, what? How do you go about fixing that? And if it's not, how do you go about preventing that going forward? Yeah, that's a real good question, actually, because, you know, Tim had mentioned about, you know, when you go to heat treat, you got to be careful because you, you do risk more of a warpage or, you know, we've even paid for heat treating to go through a straightening process. Uh, if the casting's warped, it makes it to us. Uh, if it's a T6 part, it probably has to go back to the heat treater to be annealed and then the straightness worked out because you can't hardly move it once it's T6. I mean, you take the chance of cracking it. Yeah. Um, if it's a T5, um, you know, you, you can still bring that casting right back to form. But that's a good question because T6, uh, if it gets to us and it's twisted, then it either goes back to heat treat or it might be kicked out for a non-conformant part. Well, I'm sure when you're mounting it up to the machine, you can, there's ways around mounting a T6 and getting it into the, the shape that you want it to, to machine it. But ultimately what you're going to see when you pull that off the machine is that part's going to flex back and you may have got the machining right, but the part still isn't hitting the end, the end function and features. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. If, it, if you get that flexing going on and clamping and whatnot, then you're just chasing your tail because it's not going to meet the print, you know, Obviously, if you clamp it and you think you got it all clamped up and the machine's fine when you release it, then it's just going to twang right out, of, right out of spec. So that's a good question. That brings up a, a, something I was just thinking about. So when you're machining it, do you ever release tensions? And let's say it comes in dead nuts, square. Mm -hmm. You machine it, does it release tensions? Does it move sometimes after you machine it? Sure. Um, we try to use the 3.1 system as the gospel for a datum system which is what well you got a plane we use a plane and we use a three-point system and then we got two points which is the b and then you got a c point and if you can hold a part pretty neutral uh, when you're machining it even if you want to qualify the part before the next operations then you you'll probably have a success story <laughs> so you know you can't clamp it in a distorted fashion and then expect to have a good part at the end of the day. So the key is to get bring that part in, the casting in, ready to go. So yeah. I know you guys trade back and forth with the foundry uh, straightening fixtures mm -hmm. or, or, or templates that you can see if it is square before they even bring them down to the to the machine shop. Yeah, <clears throat> if you're gonna take a casting right out of the mold and not do any kind of heat treatment to it at all, um, you might take a chance of it's kind of a thicker part and a bigger part where once you get done machining it, you'll see that thing kind of stress relieve. Um, we use a T5 a lot um, to stress relieve it. Um, cost is less than T6. Plus, when you get done machining it, it doesn't want to release those, you know, twangs on you, if you want to call it that. Distortions. Cool. So Jim, there was a there was a good question that came across about a specific alloy. Uh, I'm trying to stay away from that, but more in the terms of the following question, where it said, "Have you experienced any gummy material?" So are you are there different alloys that are gummier than other? You know, to be honest with you, Tim, my experience has been with um, 356 cast aluminum, um, and then you know, a whole different animal is a ZA12, and then zinc. Uh, we make a lot of zinc parts and, um, you know, 90% of our parts are aluminum, but uh, I've got experience with aluminum, zinc, and ZA12, which okay. is a little hybrid between zinc and aluminum. Absolutely. All right. Um, all right. Coolant. Talk about coolant. That's, coolant. that's a big deal. Yeah. Coolant's a big thing. You think you can just buy it and you know, get your machine filled up and ready to rock and roll. But I actually have a guy that um, we do coolant maintenance and we do a, we started out doing a, we found a coolant we really liked, but we checked it every morning for uh, bacteria growth. 
and any fungal growth uh, that would be in the sump. Um, they make little things you dip in there and a 25 hour check. Uh, and we did that for about three months that we found that our coolant was good and stable. Um, the, the lubricant you use to machine cast, I've been through a lot of them. Um, you know, there's synthetics, semi-synthetics, semi -synth uh, micro-emulsion type coolants and stuff like that. And I kind of, my favorite's the, the uh, micro-emulsion coolants. It kind of takes and it will actually mix tramp oil in with it and use it for the machining purpose. And it, it works well on a uh, cast aluminum. So, so, so your shop, your machine shop only machines aluminum a little bit of zinc. Coolant at, other, at a machine shop that does, you know, let's say they do brass and, or bronze and steels, irons. Mm -hmm. Do your your stuff is dialed into that? Yeah. What about other shops? I mean, are they use more of a universal type of thing, or what's yeah, there's it? yeah, there's so many coolants out there, and a lot of good coolants too. It's finding the right one, and, and it's the one that's friendly to your your guys on the floor too. Uh, dermatitis. Uh, I had one issue, and there was no coolant that just worked for him. He was, you know, fair skinned and, you know, allergic to coolant. I don't care which one it was. Um, so I found this one coolant. Um, like I said, it had a good biocide package. When I say that, um, it controls the bacteria growth because there's a, an aerobic, an uh, anaerobic bacteria can grow in your coolant. Uh, that can cause your guys to have dermatitis. Uh, we do supply uh, latex gloves. The guys want to slip some latex on, you know, their hands are in it all day long. Our goal is for them to leave, you know. So, so you're, sorry to interrupt you there, Jim. Um, That's so, so, so ultimately your, your goal with the coolant, it, it's going to aid in, you know, machine life, your tool life, uh, hitting the quality on the parts, but you're, you're even talking about it from a perspective of, you know, employee protection. Oh yeah, it's it's probably one of the biggest things. You know, you gotta if you can get a one year sump life out of it, you know, and you want to dispose of it, then you know that becomes another issue. You know, is how do I get rid of my coolant that's old? Or you come in over the weekend, it's you know your sumps have set all weekend, and the shop smells. You know, because it, the odor, if you smell a, a bad odor then it's nor it's growing bacteria so you know you're losing your coolant quick when you smell the the stink and yeah, what's the, the total the function of the coolant is what it's a lubricant it's got the lubricity in it for the the cutting tools um most people at machine probably know that you know it's it's made for don't now don't get me wrong i've did some dry machining not on aluminum but for 356 cast aluminum, you, you need a good coolant, uh, micro emulsion type. When you immerse, I mean, it's it's flowing when you yeah. cast your machine in. Yeah, we do. We get 1,000 psi through the spindle coolant. Um, any deep hole drilling we do, you know, it delivers coolant to the tip of the drill. Um, and we've had this coolant for about 10 years now. That brand. Yeah. Yeah, and this does real well, and it's got a good sump life. Okay, now married to that's the cutters. Talk about the cutters that and the type of uh, tooling you use within the machining mm -hmm. center. Yeah, when we do turning work, um, we use PCD, and uh, it works real well. Uh, we do some PCD in milling, not so much. Um, What's PCD? It's a polycrystalline diamond tip that's brazed in. It's a little bit more expensive than your standard carbide end mill, but you'll get 10 times the, the distance out of it. Um, uh, we use a high shear, high polished uh, insertable cutters mostly. And then, you know, the good old standard solid carbide. Okay. Interesting. Do the tool, does the coolant and the cutters are they married together? I mean, I mean, is there? They need each other. And <laughs> yeah. do that. I mean, so it, it, all over, over the years, you play with different types of cutters, different types of coolant. Mm -hmm. And my question, I guess, is, do you, were these married? This is the combination that works best. Yeah, yeah. I've had some coolants in where you know the the drums were a lot cheaper. Um, as a form of the machine shop, you know, I got a managed cost. 
And then you got a budget? Yeah, I got Seriously? a real tight budget. <laughs> But, you know, you go out and you shop around and the guy's got, you know, the best coolant on the market and guarantees it. And it's a big deal to try coolant out. If you got a coolant you like and you got to try another one out, to be fair to the coolant, it takes a full drain of the sump and you got you to clean it top and bottom, get the new coolant in it and try it. And I've had it re really not tap the first hole. I mean, it, I shut it down that same, within one hour that coolant wasn't wasn't going to machine that far, so I lost probably over a day's production on that one machine. On that one machine, trying to get that coolant back out, and then the guys like we got something different. And you know, this trial and error. I'm sure there's a lot of guys out there that's experienced this can cost you a lot of you know production. So do you pay a little bit more for it. Don't be afraid to. <laughs> Peace of mind. <laughs> if it works yeah. for you. Yep. Jim, that, that actually, uh, so we got, we had a good question come across from Tanner here. Um, and, I, and before I ask it, I, I do want to remind everybody, if you do have questions, you know, we're getting a lot of really good ones coming in. Uh, make sure you're asking those in the questions section and we'll make sure these, these guys get put on the spot and we, answer, we get them to answer them. Um, so good question here from Tanner. Uh, is there any time you'd recommend to not use coolant? Uh, so like I said, Tanner, there was a time uh, we were machining some cast iron and we were also machining some tool steel and um, I had a guy come in and he said I've got some coated carbide and we want to machine this cavity of this mold without coolant and we're going to run very high speeds and feeds lighter cuts you know everybody knows about high speed machining it's a lighter cut but faster speeds and feeds and I'm thinking there's no way well, we cut this cavity, and I'm not saying how long it would have took me, but we did it, a big cavity mold within four hours. And this thing was was cranking. And we had high-speed look ahead, obviously, but I guess the theory was is to get the heat into the chip and not into the cutter uh, cutting flute. And you, when, he, when we got done, I literally touched the end of that cutter, and it was still normal and it was like getting the chip into the the heat into the chip and not in the cut so you know there's ways of machining tool steel and cast arm without coolant because cast arm can really mess a machine up um but so yes to the answer aluminum 356 no <laughs> i haven't seen i haven't seen a method okay thank so you the, the iron and steel that was back in the day you were making also making tools here, Molds. making molds here. Yep. That was years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, fixtures. Building them, making them, operate, you know, different ops, different supports. Yep. You know, machine and castings is, it's its own beast. Um, the parts come in for quote. And even before you start just looking at, you know, the machining of holes and slots and stuff that you start looking at, how am I going to hold this part at the end of the day to have a good part? So you look at the operations and the strategy, um, and that's done with me in engineering. And uh, I got another lead guy that uh, gets involved, you know, what's the best, best method for attacking this thing? Um, and it might, you know, we always try to get in one operation. Uh, I found that sometimes it's just best to, you know, do one operation, get as much done as you can, maybe qualify it up for the next operation. So we'll say it's a two op or even maybe three op. Um, we're in the horizontal machining world now, uh, so we can do a lot. Um, so basically that's the biggest strategy is the uh, the nature of the beast on how you're going to hold it and datum it and clamp it and you you might have to put your best foot forward and then if you got areas that aren't supported then you can buy there's a lot of work holding people out there that have uh, like will fire off some uh, work supports and what those things do is they're pretty neutral you collapse them down Get your part clamped up and then you fire these things off um, a spring loads you know you don't want it to 
to store the part when it comes up to hit the part, but they're spring loaded and they come up, hit the part, and then you lock them down and you can add extra clamping to uh, help stabilize the part for, you know, machining and so you don't get chatters and stuff like that. So uh, 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 an op for you is you put it into a fixture mm -hmm. and you can do all kinds of different tools on it. You need to do just, you know, you, you can cut, you can drill, drill, tap, all those different. So the amount of tools doesn't matter. The next stop is when you take it off of that and put it on again on something else, another fixture or, or whatever. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. The difference between the ops. Um, what's nice about the second op is you've kind of qualified the part um, and you've set some, you know, using the three, two, one uh, datum system I was talking about. Uh, the part should be flat. Uh, if you take it over to the table and you lay it down, I just milled the surface and it's rocking then you might have distort you know you might not have the best system you know and don't be afraid to step back and say maybe this wasn't the right approach we've had that mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh but to go to the second op you know it's a lot easier than getting the first op going so you've had some pretty big castings in the past i remember that big one oh with, yeah uh, that's a good story that's, so we were pre-qualifying a, a very large casting mm -hmm. for a machine shop in Texas mm -hmm. and um, this guy he just he was a whiz he was an older gentleman he's by 75 when he came here he flew a red eye in mm -hmm. walked in and saw that fixture and he was like oh my god you know yeah it was a big old base casting and the thing was probably four and a half foot tall by three so it already had issues you know ergonomically you know how do you handle this big old thing uh, actually, this thing was quoted a two-person operation. Um, so you, we cast it and whatnot, and then we had to take it to this big fixture, big jig we built. And uh, we actually cast it three holes, talking about the three-hole plane. Um, so the two guys would lay it on this fixture and they'd clamp it. And then on four corners, we had this big old, these big levers that you get under it or you get on top of it to bring the four sides into a flatness of just say 60 thousands, you know, from an old standard. Uh, and we had like little slide gauges that you would slide under the corners, pretty much a pastel gauge. And uh, that's how we did every one of them. And God, uh, was there 10,000 of them? Oh, we ran them things forever. I remember going to his shop in Texas, and, and it was in Dallas. And uh, a big machine shop, man, machines were running like crazy. Mm -hmm. And he, he stops. He walks over and tells the guy the bearings going out on that machine. He could hear that overall. I'm like, yes, yeah. this guy's been around. Well, didn't he come up because he was questioning how we were checking flat? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Walked in, saw it. Yeah. Was happy. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right, speeds and feet. So this determines cost, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. So tell me how you talk about programming, um, checking stuff out. You know, how do you know, you know, Mm -hmm. how, how much material you're removing, how consistent the casting is going to be, how you find the casting, those kind of things. Yeah, speeds and feeds, we kind of talked about the limitations. Um, the biggest benefit that's happened to us is, is that the foundry was robotic sawing. Um, every year we do like two parts a month we pick out and it's cycle reduction is our target um we got methods of taking little gopros mounting them in the machine um my gopro your gopro my gopro for my bicycle <laughs> tim's a gopro <laughs> and uh, we actually video the cycle and um, what it allows you to do is kind of go back to your computer download um, it may just be tweaking speeds and feeds it may say if we buy this cutter, we can we can improve cycle by doing this. And like I said, we we do two a month is what we're taxed to do. And um, I think in 2020, I was told that we had a $52,000 savings in machine cycle time reduction. Um, and what I was kind of saying about the robotic sawing back in my day, or oh. All these are my day, but the early days where there was no robots, um, whoever sold it, whether it was John or Joe or whoever, they all sold the part different. 
So one guy might be real close to the part and then the other guy might leave a one inch. Well, the machine doesn't know that. So when the machine comes down and engages into that guy that left that one inch on there, you know, things are gonna happen. Um, and then you might have the next guy that saws into the casting and you might scrap a whole load of castings over a bad saw cut. Um, whether it be he couldn't tell where the witness line of the saw was or just, you know, he just didn't know. Well, the robotic sawing was our biggest improvement for cycle time reduction. It just let us take that cut right to engagement and not have to do those cuts where it takes and, you know, make sure it's not there. Uh, so that's, that's probably our biggest so when you're, I've, I've been down your office when you're programming, and mm -hmm. it's just like the 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 uh, the foundry where they're doing the simulation. You do a simulation on on the program. Yeah, we do we do a full assembly uh, program. When I say assembly is, we have the tombstone. I don't import the machine, but I got the tombstone with the fixtures mounted on it and all the clamping, so we can tell if there's any tool interference. Um, so, you know, the simulation of it is as real as, you know, being in a machine. So it gives us a, a real good start of, you know, collisions and, and stuff like that. Now, it might not be the best start, you know, as far as cycle, the fastest cycle, but it, it's our first start. And then we, we build off that, you know. All right. So Tim Williams gets his brand new tooling job, you mm -hmm. know, report castings. When do you engage? When do you start designing the fixture? When do you build the program? At what point? Um, at what stage of the process? It's um, well, I think we like to have the PO first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, and and it's in the quoting. I mean, as soon as I get, you know, Tim brings a job in and he says, "Hey, you know, what do you think of this?" Um, or Karen, you know, Karen comes down, we interact a lot for uh, quoting. It's it's like day one, you know, it's. So you don't wait for the casting? No. So you take, do you take the, what, the model, the solid Oh, model? yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, our, I like to be fixtures built and coming in the door and the molds coming in and programs developed because we don't have to have that stuff, All right. you know. It can come in and a lot of times everything's ready. You mount the part on the fixture, put it on the machine. Um, even in cutting into production isn't that big a deal because with the horizontals, we got tombstones. Uh, we can lift one tombstone off, set it right on a cart, set one on with our sampling uh, in between shifts. And we can work through sampling and then put that other tombstone with the job right back on there be running production through the other other two shifts so Jim, yeah Jim, a, a great question came through and it, you know it sounds like when you get into the robotic saw a lot of what we're trying to do or what you're seeing in the industry is a lot of the uh, process going from a, an, art, an art more to a science and it sounds like that's what you do when you're setting up and designing a part from that day one that you just mentioned um, but uh, Brian here asked a very good question from more of the art side of the thing. Um, so when he said when uh, machining steel, certain sounds and vibrations translate to changing up the speeds and feeds. For aluminum, are there some sounds or vibrations that you look for when you change speed and feed? Or are you trying to translate that, you know, are you trying to translate that more into the science side of things and do it from that perspective? Yeah, it's exactly, I think probably the same sound. <laughs> you know, that chattery, you know, raise the hair on your arm kind of sound, just you know it's not gonna look good when it's done. Um I've even I've even dampened some of the um you know the casting that were so weird in shapes, more of roundy areas with a, a sandbag, you know, something that wouldn't let the coolant get through there, but you could lay it on the port and obviously it, it worked you know it took the vibrations and the, the chatter out of it um and then i you know also you can take like if it's steel or whatnot and you can just increase spindle or feed rates uh leaving the spindle speed at one speed and just increase the feed rate to 
change that whole vibration thing too. So, you know, work support, just a dampening thing or, or work with your, your feeds, uh, maybe not even so much your speed, or you might be actually spinning the spindle too fast too and getting that harmonic vibration. Yeah, I've been down there and them things scream. Yeah. I mean, that's an audio, like an ergonomic thing. You just can't. Yeah. Yeah, ergonomics is a big thing too, especially with noise. Uh, we do uh, noise monitoring to make sure that, you know, everybody's hearing is good, you know, coolant, dermatitis, uh, handling the part. Um, you know, when the part gets so big, every, every machine shop, every company has to deal with ergonomics. Um, we have some cranes that are, are pretty cool. They're a zero gravity crane. Uh, they're using kind of two things for handling parts. Um, especially if anybody's worked around a lathe and you got a big old heavy part you got to put in the chuck that's very, you know, you can't ding it up or whatnot. This zero gravity crane, you can pick this part up and actually when you turn the, the handle loose on this thing, it will sit still and then you push a button. So this crane's programmable and it weighs the part. And once you push the button, it weighs the part, you can take it by hand and actually just move it free floating anywhere you want to move it. Now, obviously right to left's a little bit more mechanical, but just to take it to the fixture and then get it there and then, you know, tighten it up. Uh, so, you know, that's one of our biggest things we look at with a project too is, you know, ergonomics is on our checklist that takes us to the next next subject which is real quick which is you know the whole, whole idea of uh, ergonomics and you know that type of you know um, consideration so that's one of the issues you guys have kickoff meetings mm -hmm. and ergonomics is there's somebody sitting in that room who's talking ergonomics straight that's all their their issue is yep yep yeah or, you know go through the ergonomics of the handling and um, the shipping is a big deal and uh, just you know outside of how you're going to machine it is the part handling uh, so yeah it's a really big deal and then uh, we we do our first production we call it and then we do what you call a closure meeting so we all kind of group back up and uh, say okay how did it go right you know so you know if there's a foreman that has an issue in their department with you know they kind of fumbled it just didn't work out right and you know we don't sign off on it we we if we got to do it again we'll do it again and uh, we'll change up where we struggled and then go after it. so our kickoff meetings we have the sales guy represents the customer mm -hmm. we got the uh, production guy got the foundry foreman machine shop foreman polishing department shipping department and the engineers mm -hmm. and throw that thing up there on the screen and just go through every single step yeah yeah we i like when we do one a day or one yeah. at a time <laughs> yeah because it can consume a lot a lot of the day um and it's like tim said it's from the very beginning of just the, the mold design um you know you got the foundry guys you know they're saying that you know you, you know we might have to add some riser here or some entry here or some some vents for sure here you know to get this thing completely fill out uh, and it's like that all across the board through all the departments and like i said ergonomics is always mentioned and the big deal big deal so you get this great casting in weighs about 10 pounds you get done machining it weighs eight or nine pounds mm -hmm. what do you do with the all fall what do you do with that yeah that just take it back and throw it in the foundry <laughs> well if it's a casting that was um you know scrap in in-house then it goes back to the foundry if um the cast of the chips the um we have chip conveyors on all our machines they capture all the chips uh, we have a, a company that um, supplies us with totes and we fill them things up like crazy um so they the chips are recycled from outside vendor uh internal castings are melted back we have that cable boy doing it back, which, you know, that's a that's a pretty scary thing. You take a casting that just got run through a machine that's got coolant in it or coolant that might be laying in some holes or whatnot. Um, the foundry foreman, they have a 
of setup out there where they got to take these castings in for so long because, you know, if you throw a casting back into that aluminum furnace that's got condensation or moisture in the holes, it could blow that whole 2,500 pounds of aluminum out of that pot. So it can be a real unsafe practice, but, you know, how many years we've been in business, we knock on wood. Yeah, you got a system to deal with yeah. Yep. So aluminum is 100% recyclable all the time. I was just watching a video a presentation, and it, you, as long as it's clean, they can just keep recycling it, you know, mm -hmm. make it into a part, parts as life, throw it back and start it all over again. That's pretty amazing. Yep. Yep. Cool. Anything else, Tim? Guys, uh, some very good conversation there. Um, you know, had a lot of really good questions come across. I want to... Uh, to start with a, a comment though, shared by Michael, and I have to share it with you guys, this is great. Um, so good, fast, cheap, you only get two, right? And so <laughs> yeah. Jim, Jim made the comment early on there that, you know, you, you, if, if you have to pay a little extra for some coolant, uh, if it's good coolant, you wanna make sure you're doing that. Uh, it's really gonna help on the quality and uh, and aspects that our customers are looking for when they're they're designing and, and really trying to get a part into production. Um, so a, a good comment from or question from Taylor or sorry Tanner uh, came across again here. Um, so do you have a preferred software? And I believe I know the answer to that one. I think it's SolidWorks. Um, but do you and do you uh, uh, probe parts to ensure placement or design fixtures to avoid probing? So when using SolidWorks, do you do you probe parts to ensure proper placement or design fixtures to avoid probing? Uh, so what's your software first on? Software, as we use SolidWorks for CAD, and we use CamWorks for our programming. Um, I've used a few others. We found that, you know, CamWorks works well within, you know, casting programming and using assemblies and stuff. Um, probing, um, that's a good question because we have three machines equipped with probing. And the beauty with probing is that if you got a customer that wants a casting machine, but he's trying to hold things from one side of the parting line, parting line meaning, you know, when you make the part, it has two halves of a mold. And then you can start, whether the press wears or the locator start wearing, you can start having some shifts in between the relationships of the two. Uh, the thing with the probing that's nice is if the customer is saying, I want this all side to be casted, but I want these holes to be, you know, within five thousandths of that side of the casting. We're like, how are you gonna do that? Well, with probing, you can grab the casting, come over the probe, find the critical edges, and then it will zero out the machine to that home position. And you can do that and it will machine every time the right location of that. Um, so you probe every casting. Yeah, you got to probe every casting. And then if a guy had a critical bore or something, a feature that needed to be checked every time, you could re-pick the probe up after machining. It would come over because you could put in a, a pass-fail tolerance. You know, it's got to be within this spec or don't proceed. Um, I think there's even some stuff out there where it will actually correct the... Uh, compensation for that to go back and make another cut till it's right so there's a lot of cool stuff out there with the probing that you can do so are you using the cmm less and less and doing more inspection on the machine or was that would that be an accurate statement uh or do you, does the cmm prove out what you're seeing earlier in the process what we do is uh we guarantee that you know one, one part of every shift is inspected on the cmm and that's kind of a full inspection and then we cut back to a process inspection that uh, controls the process throughout the shifts. And, and a lot of that is done at the machine. Uh, the operators are supplied with bore gauges or the simple, you know, go and no-go gauges. And then, uh, you know, obviously the biggest one are our thread gauges. You know, thread quality is always a big, is a big thing for all customers. Uh, so, Yes and no. I mean, we we do do uh, are doing less than right. CMM, but um, we we still still utilize it. We still have to do it. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Did I answer well, your question? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, you guys had a lot of really uh, colorful insight today. Um, really appreciate you both taking time out of your day to uh, 
to be on the webinar today. Um, wanted to uh, let everybody know if your questions didn't get answered on the webinar today, we'll make sure we get them answered uh, following up after the, the, the webinar is done today. Uh, but I, we also want to let you know that our WEX next webinar is coming up on Tuesday, uh, 4.20 at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Um, and it's going to be talking about the finishing of casting. So, you know, Jim, Jim had discussed uh, taking parts from the foundry, machining them. Um, you know, so what does it take to get a part from that step uh, to a, a finish and a coated part and a ready to assemble part? Um, you know, we do get parts that come off of the line that uh, straight from the machine that, that can be assembled. Uh, but if you need that extra step, what does that take and what does it look like? So we're excited to have you guys join uh, if you have the time available. Uh, again, the, the date will be 420 at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today. And as mentioned previously, the webinar and the slide deck will be shared uh, shortly following the end of the session. With that, thanks guys. Have All a great right, day. Thank you.